We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Ken Renard. I am a, uh, I work with the US Army Research Lab. Uh, we are a root name server operator. Um, today we're gonna talk about uh, the root server system uh, and uh, kind of setting things up to, to discuss and understand uh, governance of the root server system. So we're gonna talk about the uh, overview of DNS kind of level set, make sure we're on the same page te technically. Um, go on to uh, some root server system, how it how it appears today, uh, a little bit about the uh, ICANN events and the organization within uh, the root server system and uh, how the root server system is evolving and uh, specifically with respect to governance. We can go to the next slide. All right, so again, a, a technical background here. Um, I hope, uh, hope this isn't too basic for everyone, but just kind of want to make sure we're all on the same page technically, looking at DNS, how it works with a focus on the root server and the root server system. So as we know, uh, the internet, yeah, the fundamental identifier on the internet is the IP address. It's a string of bits. We usually see it as a numerical label. Um, we have two versions of the internet protocol, IPv4 and v6, and you see some uh, addresses down there. They probably look a little bit familiar. Next slide. So why did we go through and do this whole DNS thing? Um, this goes back to 1980s. Um, the original problem was that uh, we as humans are not very good at remembering IP addresses. Um, computers are, humans were not. I know I'm not. Uh, and also IP addresses change, they change with regularity. Um, today's problems, um, the internet is becoming very complex and, and we try to optimize things. So um, the, the complexities, we want those to remain hidden from uh, users to make it easier. Um, but we have IP addresses that can be shared among multiple names, as well as names that uh, actually span multiple IP addresses. So all these problems contribute to why we want to do DNS. Uh, the next slide, please. So the domain, domain name system is this hierarchical layout of, of uh, essentially databases, or, or we call them zones. Um, and the typical transaction that you're going to do with DNS is use a name to look up an IP address. Right there we have on the right side, example, www.example.org, and we will contact a, a name server and get the response of the IP address. Now, IP address is one of many things that DNS stores. Um, for example, DNS is where we find our uh, mail email server mappings. Uh, that's how we can discover where email servers are. Uh, there's uh, reverse mappings. We can look at, take an IP address and look up its associated name. Uh, there's other service and security parameters that are built into this namespace as well that uh, the DNS provides this global, globally distributed, coherent, and very scalable database. So if we look at each of these blocks, um, we typically associate these with, with zones and uh, each zone uh, in, a, in the horizontal plane there, the top levels left to right, they're very independent, independent in administration as well as uh, operations. So each zone is only responsible for the content within that as well as delegating to sub zones for the top level, that's second level and third level, uh, pretty much arbitrary number of levels. So we see here, the top of this all is the root. That's how we bootstrap, we start ourselves into this namespace. So the root is very important in order to find anything within the DNS namespace. And we can go to the next slide. 
a few definitions here. Um, the root server system uh, is the, the collective set of, of root servers. This is the technical service. This is the this is what the computers on the internet that you can ask a question to and it will respond with an answer. Uh, the root zone uh, is the information uh, that sits at that top of the DNS hierarchy. It has no parent zone and it contains the information just the information necessary to discover those top level domains, those things underneath of it. That's it. Um, and a root server operator, uh, these are the organizations. There are 12 different root server operator, 12 different organizations that are responsible for managing the computers which provide this lookup service. Next slide, please. So again, the, the differences between the root zone and the root server system the root zone is, is more the information that's in in the uh, in that database. It's managed by ICANN. Uh, it's uh, you know, global uh, global contributions to policy and uh, a a, uh, a way of, of maintaining that. Um, the the root zone itself is compiled by a root zone maintainer. So this is the organization that that actually just formats this and does the uh, security uh, signing of the information in there. And that information is then provided to the root servers. The root server system is really just the technical side of delivering that content. So we respond to questions from uh, from any anywhere on the internet uh, with, with data that's in that root zone. Uh, there are 13 different root server identities each one having two addresses, IP version four and version six. So the root server system is, is purely technical and uh, the root server operators are the ones that that uh, are responsible for that. Next slide. So we'll go through quickly here the, the domain resolution process and focus on, on how uh, the root servers <clears throat> are involved. So there on, on the right side, we have an internet user. This is you that you're using your mobile device, your laptop, your smart refrigerator, talking to your smart toaster, anything, pretty much any computer on the internet can take on this role of uh, a user that, that uses information in the DNS. Now that user does not contact the root name servers directly. They go through via a recursive name server. Recursive name server is something that's configured generally when you when you attach to a Wi-Fi or configure your computer automatically, you'll have several of these available to you. So when you want to uh, ask a question, let's say you're looking for the, uh, the address of www.example.com, your device is going to contact the recursive name server first. At that point, the recursive name server is going to go through that namespace, starting at the root, asking these questions. Now, when it asks the root for the address of www.example.com, the root doesn't know. It will only give you a reference to the .com server because all it knows about is those top level domains. The recursive name server goes to the .com server, then to the example.com server, and that process completes. The answer goes back to the user. Now, a couple of neat properties here. Uh, that recursive name server is going to remember these responses from each root.com and example.com, and it's going to cache them for a certain lifetime. So if you ask again for a, uh, a, a, a address that's in the .com's uh, domain, well, the recursive name server already has the answer from the root. We do not need to go back to the root to ask that question again, because that, that answer that it got previously is valid typically for the root server for 48 hours. The other uh, scaling factor here is that this recursive name server is going to be used by tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of different users, such that that caching mechanism um, really builds up efficiently. And the chances of when, when you actually ask your recursive name server for any particular address there's a pretty good chance that somebody has already done that and it can answer from its cache. So it becomes pretty efficient. So the root name servers are, are critical to the namespace, 
but are not necessarily involved in every transaction. Next slide, please. Um, so the root servers, the root zone only contains information about those top level domains, um, like the .com, .net, .org, all the country codes. The only thing that the root servers can answer are references to those top level domains. And again, uh, about two days is the typical lifetime of those uh, of those answers. After two days, you you should ask again. Next slide. So refinements. Uh, the DNS has been around for over thirty years. Uh, over those years, um, some very important refinements have been made. DNS sec, uh, DNS security extensions allow us to cryptographically sign the data within the zones. This significantly reduces the risk of spoofing or somebody giving you an answer that they're not authorized to give you. Uh, signatures can be validated. This is something that happens at that recursive name server. Much more recently is uh, privacy enhancements. DNS was not originally designed with privacy in mind. Um, so it, these newer protocols are being uh, pretty well deployed now <clears throat> uh, to essentially protect the privacy of end users going to the recursive as well as recursive to other name servers. So um, this is ongoing. This is being uh, uh, deployed and even further developed uh, these days. So DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTPS, and query name minimization are, are good, uh, good protocols that can be used for uh, privacy. And we'll talk about uh, Anycast real briefly here. This is what allows us to have multiple computers, multiple servers that actually respond on the same IP address, uh, improving resiliency, latency, and also gives us some protection against denial of service attacks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so real quick, Unicast versus Anycast. Unicast is uh, you know, a single source and a single destination computer. Uh, this is what we kind of typically think of when we're talking maybe uh, internet computers or phones or uh, things like that. Um, Anycast is, is the case where we actually have multiple instances of the service with identical uh, information <clears throat> such that the, the user can actually go to any one of the potential computers that are implementing this uh, IP address. So typically the, the decision is made by the routing infrastructure of the internet and the uh, routing infrastructure will typically uh, choose the closest or most efficient path to, the, uh, to, the, to get to that IP address. Next slide. And we see here the, uh, um, an example of unicast where we have one source and one destination and the path that it takes through through the network. Next slide. And with Anycast, we have multiple destinations. And that path is chosen, again, by the routing infrastructure of the internet to, to find usually the closest destination, but also gives us the ability to, uh, let's say if that destination needs to be taken down for, for maintenance, um, packets will automatically be rerouted to an available instance. And uh, because we have multiple destinations and multiple paths to those destinations, we have significantly increased capacity. And that helps us in, uh, in, in denial of service attack situations where uh, we have the additional capacity to absorb some of that traffic. And that is it for the background. If there are, um, are any questions, we can take those. If, uh, if not, we can go to Lehman on the root server system today. Um, thank you. I suggest that we, we uh, try to take questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so hello, um, I, my name is Lars Johan Liman. I work for a company called Netnode. We're based in Stockholm, Sweden, and we operate one of these sets of, of servers and one of the identities, the root server identities. Uh, so uh, how did we end up with the system that we have? So I'll give you a bit of a history how we how we came to the, the, the place where we are. So next slide, please. Um, 
the root server system is as old as the DNS because it's a it's a vital part of the DNS system. So already back in 1983, when when the DNS was invented, there was instantly need for root server uh, root servers. Now the internet back in 1983 wasn't anything like what we have today. So only four machines actually acted as root servers back in 1983. Uh, then over time, as you see, the number has increased. Uh, three were added uh, so uh, in 1987 we were up to seven 1991 up to eight that was when the uh, server that we operate in sweden was added and then in 1993 uh, yet no sorry in 90 hmm uh, yes uh, 93 were up to nine addresses uh, and then again in 1998 four more were added uh, now this um slow increase in numbers here uh, was uh, based on the uh, topology of the network how it was uh, where it was deployed but also at the end limited by uh, a size limitation in the dns packets uh, we want to be able to reply with the set of all name servers in one packet and there were limitations in the, in, in place back then in the 1990s that that uh, made it possible to list only 13 addresses. Um, th those uh, limitations have been slowly removed, but another uh, important part of it was that the, the process for adding and removing uh, root name servers, uh, it more or less died with a person. Uh, back in the day, uh, the entire system was handled by a person called uh, John Postel, um, and he, he died rather suddenly. Uh, and there was suddenly no process for adding and removing root name servers. Uh, so we had to do something else. We couldn't have just 13 server machines on the internet back in the year 2000, because by then the, the system had grown quite rapidly. Um, so we needed to do something, and that's when we introduced, in 2003, we introduced the Anycast system that Ken mentioned. Um, and by using that, we could start to increase the number of servers. So we still have only 13 identities, uh, but we now have 26 IP addresses because we have both V4 and V6, so it's 2 times 13. And we also have um, uh, any cast which gives us the, the ability to deploy lots and lots of servers using these 26 IP addresses. So we are now well over 1,000 actual servers uh, serving this system. Operated about 12 operators, but, but 1,000 machines. So this is the list of uh, the 13 identities, and you see for each of them the exact IP address from which we serve this this um, the, the root service, and you can also see who's the uh, the responsible operator for that identity, and you will find in the list uh, uh, I root down there where netnode which netnode operates. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture from, uh, as you see at the bottom, the website uh, uh, rootservers.org, which is a collaboration between all the root server operators where we try to provide information about the root server system as a whole. Now, the root server operators are um, uh, in, uh, independent of each other. Uh, we, we don't have any uh, common business arrangements between us. Uh, but we do collaborate on the technical side very closely. So it's it, it doesn't matter wh whether you get your information from an H root or an I root or a B root because it's all the same and we are very well coordinated to prov provide this information to you so that it, you basically won't be able to tell whether it came from one or the other. And the, the content of the zone is identical. We use the same data. Uh, there's no, no uh, uh, exception from that rule. Uh, so this is a map, it's actually clickable on the website, so you can drill down into this to see where the root servers are located. And uh, at, this is a very zoomed out picture where you can see that there are 250 root servers uh, in, in the European region and 72 in Western Africa and so on. Uh, but if, if you double click on this, you can get into down to city level and see, see which, which identities are deployed in, in which cities. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, the root server operators operate server machines that, that provide DNS service and the data that we provide is um, the root zone. 
the root zone uh, is provided to us through a chain of, of um, uh, through a process where this, the, the data in the root zone is actually data that pertains to the top level domains. So we have, as Ken described, we have, so to speak, the pointers to where the various top level domains are located and, and can, be, can be queried for information. So uh, the content of the root zone is actually provided to the entire system by the top level domain operators. And they send in change requests to have the data in the root zone changed, and that's done. Um, the administrative uh, processing of these requests is done by IANA, the Internet uh, Assigned Numbers uh, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Um, is it? Hmm. Um, it's it's a affiliate of ICANN, and they will. Uh, process and do, do uh, due diligence on these change requests to make sure that it's legitimate and they will then send the the, the request to the root zone maintainer um, that is the company Verisign which operates under contract and they will do the the, me the mechanical chores of generating a new new content in the root zone and and generating a new file which contains these changes uh, and they will make that uh, root zone file available to the 12 root server operators. One of them is themselves, but, but uh, it's provided in the same way to all 12 of us. So the root server operators will pick up that database. Uh, it's, it's essentially a small database. Uh, and we pick it up and we each distribute that within our set of servers. So NetNode will pick up the, the zone file, the same zone file as all the other operators. We will dis, dis, um, uh, distribute that to all the Anycast instances that we operate and we will make sure that our servers provide the correct data to the DNS resolvers. Um, so um, the, the blue square in the middle, that's the, that's the job of the root server operators. Uh, and you can see the DNS client that Ken described on the right hand side and you can see the TLD operators that puts in change requests on the left hand side. Thank you. Uh, next slide please. So who are the root server operators? Uh, these are 12 different professional engineering groups. Uh, we are, uh, as I said, we don't have any, any direct ties between, our, uh, between us. We don't have any contracts, uh, but we have very uh, dedicated uh, engineering uh, resources to keep this system running uh, and if you talk to any root server operator you will find that the first and foremost uh, thing that he or she will stress is the re reliability and stability of the service uh, to us this must be up this must work uh, and we are also concerned with accessibility for all internet users uh, so we really try very hard to make our service accessible for everyone on the internet and we do so uh, uh, by providing equal service to each and every one. Uh, we are not limiting service uh, in, in certain areas or, or certain regions or at certain operators or anything. Any query that comes into a root server is equal and is treated equally. Uh, we do uh, cooperate technically, as I said, uh, I am very well acquainted with all the other operators at all the other um, root server operators, uh, and uh, we do cooperate closely. We have regular meetings where we discuss the technical problems that may arise and where we, where we look at uh, threats and defense systems and uh, 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 also at the um, uh, performance of the system that we have uh, sufficient uh, uh, resources in place to provide uh, good service to, to, to everyone. So this, this is really a group of very dedicated experts on DNS uh, provisioning and uh, I would argue that, that they are all professional. It's, it's always a joy to meet these people. The organizations behind uh, the roots of operators uh, are also very different. Uh, they all have technical expertise at a very high level um, for providing this service, but organizationally we are quite different. 
So you will note that Netnode, for instance, is a small commercial company in, in Sweden, whereas other uh, organizations are, for instance, universities or government organizations or not-for-profit uh, companies. So in, in the, in the um, organization governance, we are quite different, and that's actually a good idea. We're also geographically spread somewhat, uh, at least uh, uh, a number are operated from inside the US, but we also have roots of operators in, uh, based in the Netherlands, in uh, Japan uh, and in Sweden. Uh, and we also have very different funding models. Now, all of these differences, uh, uh, and we also make te different technical decisions. We don't run the same operating systems on our servers. We have different soft types of software for, for providing the service but the, the service that you receive on the network is always the same. Now all these things tie into the motto of the root server operators which is diversity is good. Uh, the diversity is our way to protect the system against single points of failure. Uh, if we were all uh, business companies, uh, commercial companies, there could be some kind of uh, condition where commercial companies are prohibited to provide the service. But that can't happen, happen now because some are universities they, and they are governed in, different, in, in, in a different way, which means that they are, so to speak, safe from the threats of a commercial company. Uh, and again, uh, our ge geographic spread means that if there is a law passed in one of the countries that prevents something or makes something difficult, it's not passed in the other countries. So uh, uh, we have this uh, diversity which makes the system very, very strong. And also the funding models. There's not a single source of money that controls this system because money is often tied to, uh, to control. Uh, and we, we, um, uh, we have totally different funding models for how to provide uh, the money needed to, to operate the system. Um, so if, if one source of money dries out, uh, there are still plenty of others to choose from, which are chosen by other uh, service operators. And uh, it's also known and stated that if one of the roots of operators were to be forced to stop operation you wouldn't notice because this the system is so over provisioned that that taking out an entire an entire operator with all his any cost instances is not going to have any major impact on the service at all next slide please so what are we involved with? We are involved with uh, careful operation and evolution of the service. We need to stay in tune with what's going on in the DNS, um, uh, on the DNS field, uh, because there are uh, technical evolvements. Uh, DNSSEC was added, uh, Anycast was added, and these are things that uh, IPv6 was added. These are slow and deliberate changes to the system. And we are never the first and early adopters because we want our systems to be stable. That's the, uh, the, the, the primary uh, goal that we have, uh, but we need to stay in tune with what's going on. Uh, so we will carefully evaluate and deploy suggested technical modifications. We carefully follow what's going on in the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and we make every effort to ensure that the system is stable and robust. That is our, again, our prime target. The roots of operators try very carefully to stay out of the policy making related to the data in the root zone. We really don't care what's in the root zone. That's not our business. That's the business of ICANN and possibly to some extent to the IANA. Uh, uh, and we don't change the data. We run the bookshop. We don't, we don't write the books. We, we run the bookshop where you can buy the book, uh, but we don't really care what's in the book. Uh, so we really, really do not modify data in any way, and and uh, you can you can test our systems from anywhere, and you will see that we don't change uh, the data in any way. And regardless of which root server operator you send your query to, uh, you will get exactly the same answer. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, we coordinate a lot between the roots of operators. Uh, we do attend various industry meetings and internet bodies. Um, um, ICANN, we are, are operating a separate co committee in ICANN called the Root Service System Advisory Committee. We do attend the IETF, the standards meetings. 
and various meetings regarding operations of the internet, right? Nanog, uh, APNIC, ARIN, AFNOG, what have you, uh, for, for various regions. We try to participate as best we can. And there's also a, a DNS um, uh, focus group, so to speak, called OARC, DNS OARC, which is, focuses very heavily on DNS operations in, in, in the uh, global, uh, global arena. We have diverse communication tools, uh, of course, email, but we also have uh, um, uh, phone bridges that are on standby. We, we sometimes use video calls if we have to, and we do share a lot of data uh, regarding the operations, you know, query rates and, and uh, if we have any type of attacks that's immediately shared between the roots of operators. Uh, and we even do even do various types of tests to our our uh, emergency response uh, capabilities we have the bridges which are tested regularly the phone bridges and we also actually conduct uh, training exercises between ourselves to say what would we do if and then we have a scenario that someone has thought out and we we try to uh, to address that scenario in, in uh, tabletop exercises and so on next slide please Um, I mentioned RSAC, the Root Service System Advisory Committee, which is a committee of ICANN. Uh, it's an advisory committee to the board and the internet in general, and we do issue uh, documents there. Um, one of the documents is a statement from the Root Server operators regarding the Root Service System, and that is what I mentioned before, that is that the, the reli reliability of the data received from the Root Servers. Uh, and here again, these are talking points that I've mentioned already. Every instance of the root service system, all of the more than 1,000 machines, serves exactly the same data. And the data originates from the IANA through that process that I just described, and it's made available to us by the root zone maintainer. Um, the DNA system is a hierarchy with a single globally unique root, uh, and that's very important. We, we believe the D, that the DNS should be a global system that is, is looks the same from the bottom, sorry, uh, regardless from where you look at it. And uh, uh, all clients are treated equally by the system. Um, RSEC also supports the continued deployment of DNSSEC. As Ken mentioned, DNSSEC is actually the only method you can use to verify the data you receive from, from a DNS server, regardless of which DNS server, be that a root or a TLD server or, or even a, an enterprise server. Um, if the data is not signed, you cannot really, really trust it. But if it's signed using DNSSEC, the security additions to the DNS, then you can rely on it and make sure that it's at least the same data that the appropriate entity put in the, the, the server at the other end. Um, it hasn't been modified in, in transit on the network. Next slide, please. There are a number of myths going on, going around uh, regarding root servers. Um, one of them is that the root server root servers control where the internet traffic goes um, that's not true we are the phone book of the internet we do not carry the f the, the phone conversations um, so um, the traffic on the internet is handled by routers uh, and, and that's how the traffic is funneled through the various channels on the internet uh, between the servers and clients the root service system only tells you which server to talk to and where it's located more or less um, another myth is that most DNS queries are handled by root servers. That's not true. Uh, most queries are not handled by root servers because, as Ken mentioned, there are these uh, uh, recursive servers in the middle that actually take care of the vast bulk of the queries. Remember that they have this cache. They will remember everything you have ever asked it for um, for a certain time and it relies heavily on that cache we, so it, it can mo most often it can respond directly from its own memory which means that the root servers don't have to be contacted another myth is that the administration of the root zone and the service provisioning are the same thing they are not the administration of the zone is handled by uh, IANA and the root zone maintainer uh, and that's a separate process and the policy for that process is set by ICANN uh, 
the root zone provisioning is handled by the root zone operator, but by then the content has already been set by the root zone maintainer and IANA. So we only serve what, what's handed down to us from the, the administration process. Um, another myth is that the root server identifiers have special meaning. They don't. Um, I.rootservers.net is not different from B.rootservers.net. The letter is just an index. We need to be able to, to um, uh, distinguish them from, e from each other to find the, the different IP addresses. Uh, but uh, the, the letter has no meaning whatsoever. And A root is not special in any way. It just happens to be the first letter of the alphabet. Um, some say that there are only 13 root servers. That is no longer the case. It was the case up until roughly the year 2003, but that's almost 20 years ago by now. Uh, and today we have more than 1,000 servers globally, uh, but we only have these 13 identifiers. So that's where people mix things up. Um, it's also said that root server operators conduct operations independently. Uh, well, uh, we don't have any formal uh, agreements between ourselves, but we don't uh, do operations uh, independently in, in the sense that we don't talk to each other. The collective root server operators coordinate very well and very carefully and often and friendly. So this is one system operated by 12 cooperating and collaborating uh, members uh, it's not 12 different systems um, it's also said that the root server operators only receive the tld portion of the query um, that is um, not 100 percent false but it's something that's changing here over time typically the root server operators would receive the entire name, the, the entire uh, domain name that the uh, client is asking for when, when a query actually passes up to the root server. Um, but from that, the root server will derive, it will find out which top level domain uh, the, the, the um, domain name is located in and it will send the correct referral, the correct pointer to uh, to that top level domain. That is slowly changing. So with modern technology, it, it happens that the root servers only receive the, the TLD portion of the query. So that's in slow and gradual change. Uh, it's not significant for the response from the root server. Uh, it responds with the same thing regardless. Um, it does play a bit of a role when it comes to integrity because the root server can no longer see which actual domain name further down the, tr the chain uh, the, the client is looking for. Next slide, please. So this is where I, we hoped that our colleague Fred would have joined us. Uh, I am trying to find out. Yes, Fred, you are here. Excellent. Uh, I will gladly hand over to you then. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, like Lehman and uh, Ken, I am with one of the uh, root server operators, happens to be an Internet System Consortium, which is uh, a nonprofit located in the United States. Um, and currently, I am the chair of the, uh, the root server system advisory committee. Um, so next slide, please. Now, what are we, uh, as, as Lehman mentioned, we're a uh, bunch of delegates from the different root server operators that convene to advise the ICANN community and the board on matters relating to what we're doing here. Um, th this really is a very narrow scope. Uh, we, we get a lot of questions, you know, what do you think if we add some particular TLD or uh, if we do something of a certain type in ICANN. And uh, we kind of say, well, you know, that's not the operation of the network. That's not what we do. Um, so next slide, please. So we produce advice, which are documents, and you'll find them. You, you can look in your browser and uh, RSAC is zero uh, and, and then a number, two digit number. Uh, and we'll give you a list of the uh, documents that we have produced. They include our, our operational procedures. They include ways that we measure the, uh, the system. Uh, 
the way that we measure service, uh, governance, government governance proposals, and so on and so forth. So the root server operators as a group are not represented inside the, uh, are, are represented inside the RSAC, but uh, it, it doesn't directly involve itself with the operational matter set that's handled by the root server operators themselves. So next slide. So we have representatives of the root server operators of which the three of us are uh, alternates to those and various liaisons that come from different organizations. We also have a, a larger body, uh, roughly a hundred people um, that we call the RSAC caucus, which is subject matter experts of various kinds that, um, that uh, have expressed interest in the operation of the network and the, the things that the RSAC does. So next slide. And I'm that guy on the left. Um, so next slide. Who's in the caucus? Well, we have uh, about 100 technical experts. We have uh, statements of interest from them online and give them public credit for individual work that they do. And the idea is, even though we operate the network, believe it or not, we don't know everything. And so we try to involve people that, uh, that are interested in that and, and, and are technically capable. So if you'd like to join the group, please drop an email to RSAC membership at ICANN.org. Next question or next slide. So to, uh, to identify that transparency, you can find our, our documents and our description at rsac.icann.org. The the uh, root operators are, are at a different address, which is rootservers.org. Um, you'll find in each place, uh, oh, and um, yeah, so, and, and you'll find in each place a list of our agendas and, and minutes and so on and so forth. Um, We have various public meetings. Uh, RSAC meetings at ICANN, should ICANN ever actually take, meet face-to-face, -face, are open. Uh, we invite visitors. Um, we don't invite them to join in the meeting because we're trying to get something done, but uh, they're, they're welcome to sit in and, and observe. Um, we also meet with other ICANN community groups, perform tutorials, uh, of which this, uh, this that the three of us are doing is an example. We have liaison relationships. And um, if you look for our sex zero, you'll find out a little bit about how we operate. Um, we can answer questions about the way the root server system operates and obviously do that. And so you can send a question to askrsec at ICANN.org and uh, we, we try to respond. Um, so next slide. So now the evolution um, in I think 2014 the chairman of ICANN came to uh, the root server operators and kind of said, well, you guys are here and that's great, but how do we add a new root server? How do we, you know, suppose somebody acted up, how would we remove a root server? We don't have any process because John died, John Postel, uh, as Lehman mentioned. Um, we need a, a mechanism to, to carry that out. How do we do that? And so we have been working for the last several years to um, uh, dis describe a process by which ICANN can add root server operators and provide the, the facilities that are needed. Next slide. So we started, 
we started really in 2014, but that that culminated, that process culminated in a document called RSAC 37, which um, describes uh, what I'm about to go through, which is the uh, evolution of the governance of the, of the system. And we've gone through several steps in between times, um, trying to flesh that out. The thing that we observed was we're a bunch of techies. Um, and so there, there are parts of that, that that are really not our expertise. And so we invited the ICANN community to look in and uh, provide that expertise as needed. Um, that has happened over the last couple of years uh, through the auspices of a group called the uh, the Governance, Governance Working Group, the Root Server System Governance Working Group, which includes people from throughout the community. And um, they kind of started uh, fleshing together a proposal. We stopped and said, uh, the root servers would really like to look at that proposal. And so we uh, froze that process for, I think, a period of five months. And uh, then uh, published a document very recently called RSAC 58, which gives an idea of the um, how we think that one might uh, uh, tell whether the, the uh, governance working group has accomplished its job uh, and whether the uh, a system has system design has been agreed to by all parties. Um, and we just restarted the, the GWG process with the publication of our SAC 58. So that's brought you up to current time. Uh, next slide. So RSAC 37 says a little bit about what we think is important. And Lehman mentioned this, that uh, if there's any one thing that's really important, the system has to exist and it has to work and it has to be identical throughout the world. Uh, so we've seen some people that are some sets of people that have uh, decided they want to have their own, and I, I guess I can't stop them, but um, that doesn't necessarily help in getting a, a system that operates equally everywhere. So we proposed a governance model uh, for the root server system and its operators, and um, then went through and kind of said, so what would happen if something happened and uh, how would we determine whether the uh, system is actually operating correctly? How would we correct it if it was wrong? And as really as a, as a test of the, of the design. And of course, in, in looking at that, we found some things that, oops, that wasn't quite right. But uh, you know, RSAC 37 tries to describe a proposed system and test whether it works. <clears throat> Next slide. These are six of the 11 principles. I'll get to the next five on the next slide. The key points to us, if you want to be able to trust a name and that, that it will get you to someone, whether that someone is a particular ministry within your favorite country or a particular company, a particular service, then the internet requires a namespace that is global, uh, globally unique and which is in fact contains all that information. <clears throat> the purpose of the internet assigned number authority is to provide that root data and so they do that. And we have to be, we have to provide a stable, reliant and resilient platform for all users has, has, with the same data, um, which Lehman went into in some detail. Um, now, 
uh, I think Ken mentioned that uh, we really try to operate the systems in different ways. We have different operating systems, different software that, that is used to operate the, the DNS network. Uh, we do things, we, we use different hardware. Uh, why do we do that? We, we figure that if, if there's any one thing that can take the system down, someone will try to take it down. And so we do things in different ways in order to make it harder to take the system down. Um, we obviously watch the IETF very closely uh, and, and uh, deploy the things that they say to deploy. But uh, when we see architectural change, um, we do that because there's a need in the system for that to happen. Next slide, please. Now, for us, this is, this is more than something nice that you post on the wall and forget. This is something that, that has to be true with every operator, with every piece of equipment, with every bit of software out there. And um, the system just has to work and has to, has to operate in, in, a, in an appropriate way. So, so this becomes really an ethic that's built into each of the people that works for he, the various root server operators. <clears throat> we must be transparent. We talk to each other and we engage with our stakeholder communities, which ICANN is one of, but it's not all of. Um, but at the same time, the RSOs have to be autonomous and independent. Why do we want to do that? Well, let's imagine just for fun that uh, all the RSOs were operated by the same company. Well, the company could now make, or, or one country or one, one anybody. Um, the RSOs would then be captive to them and that country could decide, you know, we don't like some other country, take it out of the name system. And uh, we, we would all have to do that. Well, so, so we operate in different companies and different uh, countries specifically to limit that, that possibility. And as, as a result, you know, we're, if you think of pipes and water, we're the pipe. We, uh, we have to be neutral, we have to be impartial and not look at or change the, the data that's going through. Um, so next slide, please. And we made, in, in our SAC 37, we made a number of recommendations. And, um, we recommended that the ICANN board initiate a process of which the GWG is the, uh, that's the reason the GWG exists. We initiate a process to produce the final version of the model, estimate the costs and, and figure out how to fund them, and then implement the final version of the model based on the principles that, that I just discussed. Um, so that remains in process at this point. I expect it'll be done during this coming year. Um, I can't really give you a, a detailed thing because we don't know that. Um, next slide. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the GWG started to come up with a different approach to things. And um, so one of our questions, uh, one of the root server operator community's questions was, how do we decide between the models that have been proposed? Um, and so we published a document called RSEC 58, which uh, lists what we consider to be important characteristics that we, you would use to identify whether the, the proposal actually worked. Um, and with that, per, build a framework to assess the, uh, the different proposals and, and the operation of the system as it goes forward. And then in, in RSEC 59, we made some recommendations to the ICANN board as to what they should do in order to accomplish that. Next slide, please. Now, this is a picture of the RSEC 37 model. Uh, 
the ICANN defines a stakeholder as someone that is affected by the actions of an entity. And so the stakeholders of the root server system include obviously the RSOs, but also the IETF and the IAB and the various members of the ICANN community, which includes, for example, uh, the, the uh, the, the TLD operators, the CCTLD, the general TLD operators, uh, the uh, the governments have a advisory committee that they populate, uh, and so on, and and so different portions of the ICANN community are each affected by how the DNS operates, and, and we consider them to be stakeholders. The uh, proposed organization of the root server system includes some things that are kind of obvious, but can probably be done by a small group of people, such as the financial function, the performance monitoring and measurement function. Um, but uh, one that is fairly wide and includes uh, input from the root server operators and from DNSORC and, and various other places, which we call the strategy architecture and policy function. Um, and obviously we have somebody that has to pick up a pen and carry things, uh, uh, own the technical equipment that is common to the, the root server system and so on. That's, that, that's the secretariat. Um, <clears throat> So those are the different parts of the proposed organization. Um, RSOs talk to the, the secretariat and um, then operate, uh, as Lehman said, over, over a thousand instances of systems all over everywhere. We develop various performance metrics. Uh, if you go to rootservers.org and then look under each of the, uh, at the bottom of the page, you'll find a, uh, a list of the different root server operators and some links to information that they maintain. And uh, part of that is PMML files of how, how, how many requests we've received, how many we've responded to, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, there, there's I guess data starting in, in the case of some root server operators as early as 2013. At this point, we have data from all of the operators there. Um, and then the decision process that's made by the SAPF, the Strategic Arch Strategy Architecture and Policy Function. Um, hello? Oh. Um, okay, my, my web browser just decided to inform me of something. Um, sorry, sorry about that. Then, okay, so our process right now, we're working with the governance working group. It's composed of representatives from various and different places and tasked with working out the details of the model um, and is busily working on the things that I've discussed. Uh, next slide, please. So if you want more information about us, <clears throat> you can go to the ICANN webpage that, uh, or the, the, the RSAC webpage maintained at ICANN, uh, look at our FAQ. Uh, you can ask questions at Ask RSAC um, I mean, for more information on the caucus. You can look at the corresponding page for the caucus itself and apply for membership. Uh, do we have one more slide? Nope, that's it. And uh, uh, the next okay. meeting is being ready to start. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you, everybody.